hard to believe that 50 years have passed since that tragic day, the 1st of September, 1939, when hobnailed German troops, supported by Stuka dive bombers, marched into Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Hitler Germany, and the Second World War had begun. Those of us who lived through that period have retained vivid memories. I, for one, was a 17-year-old youngster at that time, living in the Philippines with my parents, and like others, we wondered what all this would mean to us. As things turned out, the war would mean a great deal to our family, as it would to every family in America, indeed, in all the world. In the next few hours, you will witness in this program many of the cataclysmic events that shook this planet during the next six years. At this point, let me introduce myself. I'm John Eisenhower, Breeder General, AUS retired, and I'm to be your host for this moving 50th anniversary documentary series on the Second World War, The Road to Victory. In the course of my life, I've been accorded rare privileges due to the sheer circumstance of being the son of Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe during the Second World War, and later President of the United States. For even though I was a professional soldier, a West Point graduate, I happened to be with my father at some dramatic times during the Second World War. In his company, before, during, and after the war, I also met some important people. Churchill, de Gaulle, Montgomery, Bradley, Patton, MacArthur, Nimitz, King, and Vandegrift among them. Some of those experiences that came my way have, I hope, given me a measure of perspective on the events that will be covered in this series. I hope to be able to contribute to your understanding of them. What you're about to see is a series of official U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard film. American, British, German, Japanese. Much of this footage was shot under fire by combat photographers in all parts of the world. You will see it as an epic documentary edited in a magazine format. It is an overall chronological view of World War II covering all major events and many minor ones in all theaters of operation. Some of the highlights will include the relentless drive of Patton's Third Army across France and later Germany, the strategic bombing of Schweinfurt and Bregenzburg, B-29 superforts against Japan, the unconditional surrender of the Empire of Japan aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Adolf Hitler became German dictator in 1933, and the world became uneasy, fearful that his Nazi party might, by miscalculation, bring on war. By 1936, Hitler justified those fears by reoccupying the Rhineland, that portion of Germany that lies west of the Rhine River that was, by the Treaty of Versailles, to remain free of German military force. Soon, he repudiated the whole treaty. Again, I remember those days vividly, as my father, then Lieutenant Colonel Dwight Eisenhower, was serving as General Douglas MacArthur's chief of staff in the Philippines attempting to build a new Philippine army. Out in the Far East, we watched with some trepidation as Japan launched her invasion of the Chinese mainland. By 1938, Hitler annexed Austria to the German Reich, and in August, he and Mussolini blackmailed the bewildered Western nations into ceding him the Sudetenland, the strategic part of Czechoslovakia. He soon occupied the rest of that unhappy nation. By September 1939, Hitler had signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin. And that pact allowed him freedom to invade Poland. That he did on September 1st, as I've mentioned, and World War II in Europe was on. Three months later, my father had returned to the United States. During this hour, you will see these world-shaking events that took place in the years immediately preceding World War II. You will also see depicted the Nazi subjugation of France and England's heroic defense in the Battle of Britain. At the end, you will see footage of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, that President Franklin Roosevelt called a date that will live in infamy. At that point, the United States will become a major belligerent in the Second World War. Less than two years after World War I, 
the war to end all wars. Poland, backed by France, attacked Soviet Russia and tiny Lithuania to reclaim ancient boundaries. Romania invaded Hungary and occupied Budapest. Czechoslovakia clashed with Poland in a border dispute. Belgium and France, over British protests, occupied the German Ruhr. A far-flung series of seemingly unrelated events was beginning to weave a web that eventually would enmesh nearly all mankind. There was inner turmoil in Italy. Post-war discontent had turned that country into a political tinderbox, beset with strikes and economic unrest. A new party was on the verge of acquiring power. They called themselves Fascisti. Benito Mussolini, an ex-newspaper editor, was their leader. As far as most Americans were concerned, those small wars and foreign political turmoils were far from our ocean-guarded shores, remote from the American way of life. Something to read about in the newspapers. The old maxim, the price of freedom and peace is eternal vigilance, was forgotten in the Roaring Twenties. During the years immediately following World War I, the chauvinistic Prussian mind, stunned and humiliated by defeat, began planning for the next war. The German militarists planned exceedingly well. They would become masters of the Blitzkrieg, lightning war. All they awaited was a political leader and the coming of the next war. Bombastic newspaper editor with a gladiator's jaw led his black-shirted legions in a march on Rome. A bold fascist thrust for power. Benito Mussolini was a flamboyant reincarnation of the Caesar God image. He made good copy for the international press. He ordered large doses of castor oil forced down the throats of those who disagreed with him. Adolf Hitler, a maniac of ferocious genius, as Winston Churchill was later to describe him, led a beer hall put in Munich and was thrown in jail. While in prison, he wrote a book, Mein Kampf, which told the world exactly what he planned to do. Adolf Hitler was merely a rabble-rousing part of the political turmoil in Germany. we read about in the newspapers. September 1931, an explosion on the Japanese-operated South Manchurian Railroad resulted in the invasion and occupation of Manchuria by a Japanese army. It was a faraway Asian event that we read about in the newspapers. January 1932, Japan invaded the international settlement at Shanghai. January 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, sharing power with the aging President von Hindenburg. August 1934, President von Hindenburg died. Hitler became absolute ruler of Germany. Now he could do what he had spelled out in Mein Kampf for all to see. In substance it was, today Germany, tomorrow the world.
1935, Mussolini's fascist army invaded and conquered Ethiopia in seven months, using the weapons of modern warfare against the people who still fought with spears and primitive firearms. March 1936, Hitler, in defiance of the Versailles Treaty, which only 17 years earlier had ended World War I, sent troops to occupy the Rhineland. Amazingly, the French did not resist. Ironically, the German troops had secret orders to withdraw if the French army did resist. The Spanish Civil War became a proving ground for Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Soviet Russia. They furnished men and weapons to the opposing faction. October 1936, the Rome-Berlin Axis was formed, an unholy alliance of aggressors consolidating their forces for greater conquests. December 1937, the Japanese invaders of China bombarded and sank the United States gunboat Panay on patrol in the Yangtze River. Secretary of State Cordell Hull protested angrily. Japanese Ambassador Saito replied, The Japanese government and people wish to express their profoundest regret to the American government and people on account of this deplorable incident. The apology was accepted. World events were beginning to move with ever-increasing momentum toward a cataclysm of blood. The point of no return was fast approaching.
while the aggressors were either building up their armed might and working toward war, or were actually at war, we Americans read all about it in our newspapers, heard all about it over our radios, watched the violence and the carnage in the newsreels, in the safety and comfort of our movie theaters. It was all so far away from the shores of our great protective oceans, the Atlantic on the east, and the Pacific on the west. Besides, we had our own troubles. The United States was in the grip of a paralyzing depression. Millions were unemployed on some form of relief. A great drought had destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres of farmlands on the Great Plains, creating an arid dust bowl. Thousands of families were impoverished, made homeless. It was a tragic time of domestic travail affecting millions of Americans. The federal government had taken emergency measures to meet the growing internal crisis. Among the many relief agencies it established was the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It provided work and training for unemployed young men in a program of conservation of the country's natural resources of timber, soil, and water, and reforestation and soil erosion control. The United States Army was given the responsibility of operating and administering 1,600 CCC camps with 300,000 enrollees throughout the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Educational facilities were provided from elementary through high school, as well as college courses. Each camp was commanded by an officer, usually a captain with two lieutenants, one as adjutant and the other as supply and mess officer. It was invaluable experience and leadership for army officers. Military law and discipline did not apply to the CCC camps. To gain respect and authority, officers had to learn to rely on the personal characteristics of leadership. The president took a personal interest in the CCC program. More than 4,500 regular and reserve army officers on active duty were engaged in this work during the years preceding our entry into World War II. While this goodly percentage of our officer corps was engaged in the peacetime pursuits of making democracy work at home, The officers in the aggressors' armies were being trained, conditioned, and blooded to combat toughness by the brutal war in Ethiopia. As military advisors and so-called volunteer participants in the viciously fought Spanish Civil War, At the same time, 
Japan's continuing war of conquest in China was honing her armed forces to razor-edge sharpness. While the aggressors were flexing their mighty muscles, our army could muster only 180,000 officers and enlisted men. The Navy had less than 114,000 men. The Marine Corps, 18,000. A total defense establishment of a little more than 300,000 men. The aggressor nations continued their march of conquest. In 1938, Nazi Germany seized Austria in a lightning-like coup. At a parley in Munich, in a desperate bid for peace, Britain, France, Italy, and Germany agreed to the dismemberment of democratic Czechoslovakia. Hitler got the spoils without firing a shot. Nineteen thirty-eight was a year of triumph for the ever stronger and more belligerent aggressors. Drunk with power and bloodlust, the Nazis turned upon a large segment of their own German citizens, perpetrating their greatest abomination. German Jews were herded into concentration camps. A mass fine of $400 million was imposed, holding them collectively responsible for the assassination of one German diplomat. The concentration camps were a brutal prelude to a ghastly program of mass extermination. Now the greatest of the aggressors had brazenly come forth in full view of the world to reveal not only his evil purpose and design, but the abysmal depths of his ruthless character as well. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned from Munich. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. At Munich, Britain believed she had gained peace in our time. France sat behind her Maginot line, confident of its impregnability. It was a labyrinth of fortifications, above and below ground, considered at the time the ultimate in military defense. Elaborate, impressive, but outmoded. Within hailing distance to the east of the Maginot Line was Hitler's Siegfried Line. Its structure was comparable to the defense line of its neighbor, sealing off Germany from France with a mass of steel, concrete, and manpower. It 
Adolf Hitler toured the Siegfried Line. Now he was a powerful ruler, ready to set in motion his plan for conquest. The United States reacted feebly to the threatening Holocaust. While our military planners were considering defense measures which involved mobilization of the National Guard and the reserves for a total defense force of about a million men, actual regular army strength was increased by only 5,300 men. The Navy added 5,400. And the Marine Corps, the combat-ready shock troops, increased their strength by a pitiful handful, 133 men. We were little better off than in 1917, and the flames of an even greater conflagration were already licking at our feet. We had yet to learn the lessons of history. The aggressors drew their own logical conclusions. The United States was an isolationist nation, a nation struggling to recover from the grip of a Great Depression. 19% of its workforce unemployed. A total defense force, Army, Navy, and Marines of less than 320,000. It was the false and fatal economy of unpreparedness, the ages old invitation to an aggressor. At the War Department, the War College, and the Command and General Staff School, our dedicated military planners studied the implications of the ominous events. For through those years of the gathering storm, United States military leaders remained alert to the defense and security of their country. They were not deaf to the triumphant shouts of the arrogant aggressors. For some time after Hitler's subjugation of Poland, many people still hoped that the war in Europe might be settled without a major conflict. In April 1940, however, Hitler took Denmark and Norway, and the next month he launched the Blitzkrieg that brought about France's surrender and the evacuation of the British Army from Dunkirk. That evacuation was, incidentally, effected by heroic British civilians in fishing and pleasure boats. Hitler was stopped there. His efforts to cross the English Channel were decisively thwarted by the greatly outnumbered Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain. By late 1940, a frightened United States had instituted its first peacetime draft. Then, in June of 1941, Hitler blatantly violated his friendship pact with Stalin and launched an invasion of the USSR. In less than six months, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and thrust the United States headlong into the raging global conflict. 1939, and the fires of war in China were still raging. Half a world away, Czechoslovakia, dismembered by the Munich Pact, fell to Hitler without a battle. Hitler demanded that Poland surrender the Baltic seaport of Danzig with its strategic corridor to the sea, a prize lost by Germany in 1920 at the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Poland did not yield. In defiance of British and French warnings, the Nazis, after making a secret non-aggression pact with Russia, invaded Poland September 1st, 1939 with their smashing blitzkrieg tactics. The heroic Poles fought the invaders with a courage that was phenomenal, but futile against overwhelming odds.
the fiery curtain to Act I of World War II was raised. Britain and France declared war. The die was cast. Now British Prime Minister Chamberlain knew there would be no peace in our time. The United States proclaimed its neutrality just as it had at the beginning of World War I. 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean, it seemed, were still an ample safeguard for the immediate defense of our nation. In a cynical agreement, Germany and Russia had partitioned conquered Poland. Soon, Russia attacked Little Finland. The valiant Finns fought the Russians to a standoff. China, the two Asian giants continued their struggle to the death. With the rest of the world exploding into violent war, the New York World's Fair opened to throngs of peaceful and pleasure-loving Americans. The wars in Europe and Asia were still far away. We read about them in the newspapers and watch the unfolding events in our newsreels. Again, as at the beginning of World War I, we had proclaimed our traditional neutrality. Millions of Americans were more interested in Joe DiMaggio and the New York Yankees taking four straight from Cincinnati in the World Series than they were in the deadly games being played in Europe and Asia, where aggressors were out to take all. In the grim international game of war, the aggressor teams were pitching and running the bases in what then looked like a shutout. But the World Series in that big league had yet to be played. Three years before, General Douglas MacArthur had retired from active duty to become military advisor to the Philippines. Dwight D. Eisenhower, then a field grade officer, was a member of MacArthur's staff. By coincidence, General George C. Marshall was appointed Chief of Staff the same day the Nazis invaded Poland. Omar N. Bradley was a member of the War Department's General Staff. Leslie J. McNair was Executive Officer in the Office of the Chief of Field Artillery. General Brehan Somerville was head of the Depression-Borne Works Progress Administration in New York City. It would be another year before General Henry Hap Arnold would become Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army Air Corps. Robert L. Eichelberger was still a colonel, commanding the 30th Infantry at the Presidio of San Francisco. George S. Patton, Jr., a colonel then, was post commander of Fort Myer in Virginia. Mark Clark was a member of the staff of the 3rd Division at Fort Lewis, Washington. General Walter Kruger commanded the 2nd Division at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Courtney Hodges was then a colonel, assistant commandant of the infantry school at Fort Benning. Alexander M. Patch was serving as a lieutenant colonel on the infantry board at Fort Benning. 
Their commander-in-chief, the President of the United States, took the first step that was to make America the arsenal of democracy. In November 1939, Roosevelt signed a bill removing the Arms Embargo Act. Now we could supply the implements of war to England and France on a cash-and-carry basis. Full-scale Lend-Lease was still in the future, but our neutrality was starting to crack. The wheels of our industrial complex were beginning to turn. The slumbering, complacent giant among nations was awakening. Slowly, we began to increase our military manpower. The Army was authorized to recruit some 83,000 men. The Marine Corps, 10,000. The Navy, 42,000. But our combined military establishment was still less than half a million men. Hardly a token force in light of world events. Only a small handful of our forces was adequately equipped and partially trained for combat. In the spring of 1940, the Nazi war machine rolled into Denmark and into Norway. The gallant but small Norwegian army was forced to withdraw to last-ditch positions in the north. In one deadly swoop, the Nazis overran Belgium, Luxembourg, and smashed across the French frontier. It was Blitzkrieg, lightning war. The aggressors struck with massive air power. With armor, with mobile artillery, Strike fast, strike hard with overwhelming, ruthless force. Destroy entire cities, reduce them to ashes and rubble, along with the charred bones of their inferior civilian population. Show no mercy. Destroy the will to fight. Show them the hopelessness of resistance. Those were Hitler's orders. The British rushed in what combat-ready troops they had to try and help the French stem the German tidal wave that was sweeping the continent. Winston Churchill, an indomitable man of the century, born of an English father and an American mother, took over the reins of government. In America, another great leader put before Congress and the nation the urgent need for defense. These are ominous days, days whose swift and shocking developments force every neutral nation to look to its defenses in the light of new factors. The brutal force of modern offensive war has been loosed in all its horror. Surely the developments of the past few weeks have made it clear to all of our citizens that the possibility of attack on vital American zones ought to make it essential that we have the physical, the ready ability to meet those attacks and to prevent them from reaching their objectives. Our task is plain. The road we must take is clearly indicated. Our defenses must be 
invulnerable, our security absolute. The French army was fast disintegrating. British forces were saved from annihilation or capture by the miraculous evacuation at Dunkirk. Italy declared war against France and Britain. Paris, undefended, fell like a ripe plum into the Nazi basket of conquests. What remained of the French army retreated to Mediterranean ports for evacuation to North Africa, to live to fight another day and help win the victory. Hitler signed an armistice with France and became master of all Western Europe. He could now concentrate on the destruction of his greatest adversary, England. for her life, and the Atlantic Ocean stood between the United States and what was then the most powerful conquering armed force the world had ever known. On the 1st of September, 1940, in response to the growing peril, President Roosevelt called up 60,000 National Guardsmen from 26 states for one year's service. In the same month, for the third time in its history, Congress enacted a selective service bill. Sixteen million Americans registered for the draft. There were some who asked, why me? But the majority knew why. And despite any inner emotional conflicts, they responded in the same spirit as had their forefathers. They knew that the gutty men who made and preserved this nation never asked, why me? These were men who could look anyone in the eye and say, I'm proud to be an American and to serve my country in its time of need. From the cities, the towns, the villages, the farms, the plains and the mountains they came. Citizens from every walk of life who would soon prove themselves to be soldiers in the finest traditions of the American fighting man. Within a year, our army grew to a million five hundred thousand men. It would continue to grow to a peak strength of eight million. They had to be trained to combat hardness if they were to meet and destroy an enemy already toughened and blooded by combat. A new and mighty army was being forged along new lines to meet the challenge of improved enemy weapons, new tactics, new stratagems. At last, our top military leaders were being given the wherewithal to implement plans they had made for the defense of America under direction of George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff. General Leslie McNair was charged with directing the gigantic training program. General Somerville was appointed assistant chief of staff in charge of supply. His was to be a superhuman task. Dwight D. Eisenhower was to have a meeting with destiny. General Hap Arnold, deputy chief of staff of the Army Air Corps, stepped up the training of much needed pilots. 
America was rising up out of the rut of her apathy. She was beginning to understand the hard fact that she was an integral part of the world. A world that suddenly had become one of violence and brutality. One in which America would have to fight to the death if she were to survive. While we were marshalling our resources, England was being given the bloodbath Hitler had promised. Britain's Royal Air Force fought night and day, taking a heavy toll of Nazi bombers, inspiring Winston Churchill's famous statement that never had so many owed so much to so few. Americans knew what would happen to the United States if Britain fell. Our response to the desperate plea for help came late, but not too late, in 1940. It is the purpose of the nation to build now, with all possible speed, every machine and arsenal and factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We have the men, the skill, the wealth, and above all, the will. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. In North Africa, British forces were fighting an Italian drive upon Egypt. Nazi and fascist troops smashed into the Balkans, into Greece. The Greeks fought with their traditional courage, but were overwhelmed by the Nazi tidal wave. 1940 was a black year for what was left of the free world. 1941 was to be an even blacker year, during which the aggressors attacked the only two remaining major powers not yet at war, Russia and the United States. For the aggressors, it was to be the world or nothing. In June 1941, Hitler suddenly unleashed his forces against Soviet Russia. wounded, the Russian bear retreated, falling back before the onrushing Nazi legions. There was only one major power in the free world to go, the militarily weak United States. Now she stood alone, but how long could she stand? The Asian Axis partner thought she had an answer to that one that would complete the aggressor's pattern for conquest of the entire world. It was a quiet Sunday morning in Hawaii. A newly risen sun shone on beautiful Oahu was symbolic. It was the last time we were to be caught napping by a rising sun.
the surprise attack was a staggering blow to our Navy at Pearl Harbor. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Soon, the fall of Bataan and the never to be forgotten death march of thousands of American and Filipino troops. Many would never reach the prison 65 miles away. Hundreds met death along the way.